All right, we're recording. So again, my name is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester and I host the Forest Connect webinar series, which is part of the overall Forest Connect program. And each month we have, except for August, but each month we have presentations and we're uh, oftentimes fortunate to have really phenomenal presenters and this month is no different. We're joined by Dr. Ralph Nyland. Ralph is a household name in forestry households around the Northeast and uh, has served as a professor of silviculture and now as professor emeritus of silviculture with the uh, distinction as distinguished service professor from the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. So Ralph, welcome, and I'm going to mute my microphone, and it's and it's all yours. Greetings to everybody. Glad you came out of the woods. I want to, to focus on beach today, and as the title suggests, we have a choice of either controlling beach or suffering a long-term consequence if we ignore beach. So this story has seven chapters today, and it's a rather complex tale. So let's start with the history, a bit of history anyway, with the idea that root suckers will increase after disturbance. That's an important concept. Understory beach has been historically present in the forests of Northeastern North America. Uh, some of the early records go back into the early 1900s. So the presence of beach in the understory predates the beech bark disease by decades. We also know that uh, understory disturbance of some kind will trigger root suckering, particularly after logging, let's say. We know that from the work of David Houston and others. And that these uh, root suckers likely originate from injuries to shallow roots that Callus forms on the injury, adventitious bud form in the callus, and we get a new root sucker. Where skidding disturbs the roots, but there are historic records that even a deer or you, you with your boot walking across the very shallow root can cause that injury and eventually root suckering. Now the story gets compounded by the protracted browsing of deer in some regions, not everywhere, but where deer browsing has been a, a, a problem, and then those deer will eat the species other than beech, the species that might outgrow the beech and become part of a new cohort. So the, the presence of deer, but the root suckering that has come from logging and other disturbances leads to this dense beech understory that we've probably all seen throughout the forest, the northern hardwood forest anyway. The early silviculture research by Curtis and Rushmore with the experiments that uh, were initiated in the Adirondacks in 1938, give us a real picture of what happens in stands that are given uh, silvicultural treatments without beach control. They had four treatments. One was an uncut control. The stand had uh, 112 square feet of base arch, six inches and bigger and probably there was another 10 to 15 square feet in smaller trees. They did no treatment of any kind here. And this was at the time of high deer density and before beech was considered an issue. In fact, in the days when they started this experiment, people were favoring beech because of its good form, its good growth. They added a second treatment, which is selection system, cut back to 72 square feet. And then half of the plot, they removed the trees less than two and a half inches and mowed the seedlings. Then came back in 10 years and retreated re the stand back to 65 square feet, primarily by poisoning poor beech. And at that time, they added deer exposure. They also used a clear cut, taking out all the trees two and a half inches and bigger. And then on half the plot, they mowed the seedlings and cut is less than two and a half inches, and also added deer exposures at 10 years. The last treatment was shelter with seed cutting, cut back to 48 square feet in trees six inches and bigger. Uh, the, there were probably were smaller ones out there based on this. They, they mostly cut beech during the treatment, and they did no mowing. But after three years, 
the added deer exposure. So here are the results 13 years later. In the uncut areas, the control plus, the only thing they found in the understory was beech. And it became very abundant. With the selection system, where they had no exclosures for 10 years and they had no beach control, beach developed. Clear cutting, beach became the most abundant among the saplings. When they did add exclosures at 10 years, they did see an increase, a slight increase in the yellow birch and sugar maple over a foot tall. So the shelterwood pot turned out the best. It had desirable ceilings over three feet, but only inside the exposures and in conjunction with beach control. So the, the end point here by Curtis and Rushmore said that in all of these treatments, beach would dominate the understory. Deer would have a profound effect on regeneration of desirable species. In the shelterwood cutting, that was best. When you coupled the cutting with deer control, and beach understory control. Simply having tall advanced sugar maple was not enough to ensure it's being a part of the new cohort. In 1958, uh, Farnsworth and Barrett initiated a similar experiment on the Huntington Wildlife Forest at Newcomb. And they found that if they fenced but didn't do beach control, beach dominated. If they both fenced, and did beach control, other species regenerated. Now, beach was appearing on the scene in the late 50s in that area, but the, the killing front had not moved through yet. And deer browsing was a problem, as, as the plots here show. So the evidence from both uh, experience and from bo and experimentation shows that logging and other disturbances will promote advanced feeds development into a dense understory even before beech bark disease. And, and note that a recent study in Western Quebec, where the killing front has not yet reached, they found the same thing. Beech dominated, beech understories formed. Well, then things got worse through time. As the beech bark disease moved down from Nova Scotia and through the, the Maritimes and into New England and New York and beyond, <clears throat> Uh, the understory seemed to become uh, very more dense with beech. Um, it seems that they come from root suckers off of trees that are affected where the, the crowns are weakening. And the, the idea is that uh, those hormones that are produced in the crown that suppress or inhibit root sucker development and sprouting, as the crown weakens, those hormones are less produced and you begin to see root suckering and, and stump sprout. Now here's the awful story. Uh, Peter reminded me about the forest inventory statistics. So look at these from, this is only for New York, but beginning in 2007 at the bottom and on up to 2017. And note that we're talking about millions, millions of small beach. So from 2007, the density of abundance of small beech increased by 1.1 times. And by 2070, it about doubled. Uh, that would be what, 1,846,000,000 beech across New York State, just in New York State. That's an ominous thought. In fact, it is due to the combination probably of the root suckering from beech bark disease and suckering off of injured roots after disturbance. And importantly, this is the setup for the future forest. Beach will be increasingly dominant within our forest. Let me share an example uh, here in central New York. Stand, 35 acres, uneven age, treated by selection system, following the Arbor Gas guidelines. We tallied the uh, one to three and a half inch beach on 100 foot grids, sample points on 100 foot grids. And this is the first cutting cycle. So start in the left center, 1974, then go to 79. Somewhere around 1975, we saw the killing front at this site. Then keep going clockwise until you end up at the bottom center and 
and there's the end of a 20-year period. Uh, notice that the darker green and more abundant blotches of green, the darker the color, the more dense the beach. So beach became more dense and it spread through the stand. Now the second cutting cycle from 1974 to 2009, the same pattern. Notice how the density of the beach is increasing and the abundance of beach, that is the plots with beach on it, are increasing 36 years after the first entry. So in this 36 year period, we went from beach that we didn't see any reason to control at all the beach that's a major problem and we had to initiate some control. And this is a time of low deer density. So it doesn't take deer browsing to cause this problem, but they can make it even worse. So look at the numbers from that stand. <clears throat> Good number of sample points of all sizes uh, from 30, 73 to 91, about a third of the, of the plots had beach on it of any size. And then it doubled by 2009. And look at the small beach, less than three and a half inches. 7%, it doubled to 16% of the plots and went up to a third of the plots over that time period. So beach has increased through time with the common, with due to the logging and the beach park disease. Understory has increased and beach has become a problem. So you need to take it seriously everywhere. It won't go away. It just gets worse. Now that understory beach is a problem because it interferes with regeneration of other species. As the root suckers develop, they form a very dense subcanopy layer. And that dense layer casts a heavy shade on the ground. As the, in the shaded environment, the beach tend to grow laterally. That is the lateral branches extend more than the vertical development of the tree. And those branches interlock and form this very dense shade. And, and in, that, in that shade, there's too little light apparently for maple and other species to survive and develop. Elizabeth Haynes' work shows that. We did some work uh, in Newcomb, New York by taking out the beach understory. So here's the, on the left where the beaches, beach understory is still present. And on the right where we removed the beach understory. These are, these are plots near each other. And it indicates to me the idea that, that uh, the light is a controlling factor. Notice in the, on the right, it's not just tree seedlings that are abundant, but you can pick out some herbs in there. And Forrester and Bone showed that removing that understory helped increase the abundance and diversity of herbs. So with the beach understory, you get little non-beach regeneration, reduced tree seedling diversity, reduced herb species diversity and fewer herbs. In a sense, the beach understory is simplifying the ecological system and by a native invasive species. Take note, our government agencies do not recognize beach as an invasive species. We need to get some change there so that the support for encouraging beach control and reduction will be there and, and encourage landowners to do it. Well, what's the evidence of the interference that it leads to a simplification of, of the vegetative component of the system? In 2001, uh, Bone published a paper that uh, where she developed a species importance value. Now that, that was done by taking the number of beech and of other species in each height class on a milliacre and she weighted the number by the height at the midpoint of the diameter of the size class and then summed across height classes. So this would, would mean that the taller the sapling or seedling, the more weight it would get in this index. She did it for all species except beach and for beach. And it would indicate the importance of beach in areas where there's an understory. Here's her findings based on eight to 16 year measurement data from five selection system stands. When beach is not present at all, the beach important value comes up at zero. If the beach importance value is above 0.5, that's a high beach stocking. 
That's a dense understory. And in both of these cases, beech will remain the same. If there's none there, it won't develop necessarily. And if it's high stocking, it won't get any less. The plots where beech is about 0.25, those beech is and higher, those beech plots transition towards greater beech dominance through time. So the beech understory was, was building through time on those plots. In 2012, Lindsay Nostrom developed a prediction of the number of non-beach that would be one inch in diameter on milliacre plots. There are two sets of curves here. The, the vertical axis is, is representing the numbers of non-beach one inch in diameter or more. And the horizontal axis is time for a period of up to 20 years. And then the upper set of curves marked in green are for plots where the beach importance value is less than 0.5. And the lower set of curves where beach importance value is 0.5 or more. And here's her findings. This is for uh, plots with less than 0.5 importance value. And the upper curve, the dark one, is for shows that uh, at 12 years, there will be about 200 trees per acre and stands cut to 65 square feet. If you cut to 95 square feet, you get about 150 <coughs> to the acre and it will peak at about eight years. But notice the bottom curves. That's where the beach is abundant on the plots, but 0.5 or larger. There's essentially none non-beach species that reaches one inch in diameter. So you can't delay the action. You have to get right at it when you find um, beach present in the other And don't ignore the deer if it's a problem. You have to control it as well. So beach control is necessary if you want to maintain plant species diversity and abundance. Plus you have to have low deer density. There's an accepted rule of thumb by many writers that if you find beach dominating one third or more of the regeneration plots, you ought to do beach control. Then the question is, how do you go about doing it? A long proven approach to it is by understoring mist blowing using glyphosate. Uh, the, the machine illustrated the lower left, just one option. That was a mist blower strapped onto the frame of a skitter after taking off the arch and driving through the stand, it blows mist up to about 15 feet. And that machine spread it out about a chain. And there are more modern machines that do uh, spray out of both sides. But you notice on the right that it, it really removes everything less than about three and a half inches in diameter, and including the advanced regeneration. So when you do the mist blowing, you need to start from the beginning to build up a new cohort. But it doesn't take out trees larger than about 15 feet tall. And those will produce root suckers uh, that, that will uh, dominate the stand, at least beneath reduced density overstory. So Tiersen and, and Sage up at Huntington Wildlife Forest learned that after the mist blowing, they needed to go back to the stand and uh, treat the, the small beach that's left behind with uh, stem injection using glyphosate and do that as a supplement. Then after that was done, they would come through with their uh, timber harvesting, remove any standing beach of larger sizes and reduce the stand. This is a shelter wood cutting and, and that would stop or at least to minimize suckering off of, off of anything. So here on the left is a <coughs> shelter wood cut where they did not do the beach control, or at least not the thorough beach control. It's all beach there. On the right is the place where they did common, the, the commonly used mist blowing with glyphosate it would be, and then stem injection to get larger beach. And you see there's a rich array of uh, maple and there's birch in there and white ash and other species. Now, I recognize that many landowners are saying, no, I won't use herbicides. In some provinces in, in to the north and uh, some states here, 
uh, you have to uh, get special permissions to use herbicides. So cutting becomes uh, the easiest option, or at least the easiest from an administrative point of view. And the question then is, will it work? One way to do it is with uh, brush saws. You can take off a tree as large as three or four inches in one cut. Um, it reduces the interference and it does brighten the understory, as you see here. It's, it's considerable change in the light at the ground level, the indirect light at the ground level, by just taking out that dense mid-story or low understory of beach. Uh, we looked at stump sprouting following this brush saw cutting, and really uh, Amy Mallet observed very little post cutting sprouting in the first couple or three years. If you did in the summer, that's a caveat here. In the winter, the carbohydrate reserves have moved into the root system, and that will facilitate sprouting. In the summer, the reserves are mostly above the ground, and that reduces sprouting. Here's the results. These are three year results. Now there's a series of, of areas here, six different areas. And uh, we sorted them into two groups. These are plots which had a closed canopy or plots with a low density canopy. The low density were because of uh, the cutting was done coincident with or after the timber harvesting or because there was some opening up of the overstory. Uh, the, the, the results are variable with each one, but look, the closed canopy stands, the average was 17% uh, of the plots had at least one had a sprouting stump. And it was double that beneath the low density canopy. So from that, I take uh, very seriously the idea is you need to cut the understory beach before overstory disturbance. That's a key factor in minimizing stump sprouting in the long run. Now the, this brush saw work will take you about half a minute to a minute per tree, all work functions. And it will really be inefficient if you do it after a logging operation. A good quality, reliable brush saw is quite heavy. And to maneuver through logging slashes is uh, difficult at best. Now here's an alternative. Uh, we tried it first with the idea of providing a technique that the landowner could do without much expense. We simply took a lopping shear in this case and we cut off the small beach at a convenient height, tried to get it below the lowest living branch. And that's what it looks like afterward. Now I want you to note three beach though. I call them leprechaun sticks. Center front is cut off below the lowest living branch. Back right, cut off below the lowest living branch. And back left, you see there's still a live branch on that tree. If you cut them below the lowest living branch, it really kills the stems in the majority of cases. Here are the data. This is that pilot test. Without a live branch, 88% were dead within three years. If you had a living branch on, we only had 14 of them, but there were only 7% of them were dead. So cut off the, the tree below the lowest living branch. When the uh, uneven age stand uh, became ready for select a third selection cutting and we needed beach control, this is a stand I illustrated earlier. Part of the timber sale was to, <coughs> for the contractor to cut the small beach. And they chose to do it with a chainsaw. You see the the treatment that was done one year before any overstory cutting took place. Then they followed it by the selection system cutting where they, they cut all of the beach that was left behind. We had marked the bigger ones and they cut any full size beach. So they removed all the beach during logging. And here's the outcome. There was uh, 140 commercially sheared beach that I checked. 117 of them had been cut below the lowest live branch, and 85% of them were dead. The 24 with a, a live branch left, only 4% were dead. So if you do this, you've got to cut them below the lowest living branch. 
And I'm confident that the majority of them will die. You'll get some that won't die. Now, when they first do this, you may see a little ring of very small shoots at the top of that stub. And those will die within the second or third year. But there's, a, there's something to remember here. Two years after the cutting was done, those beech stubs were still hard as a rock. And that limited the skidding opportunities for rubber tired skidders. So uh, it forced the contractors to stay on well-defined skid trails that were already in the sand. That's not a bad thing, but just be aware that, that these will be an obstacle to movement through the stand with the machine until they, they rot and break off. Here's another technique that would be good for a landowner to try for a small scale operation. You just girdle a tree. Uh, I used a simple handsaw that's readily available at any hardware or sporting goods store and cut a double girdle. Um, I'm not why, sure why I did two, it felt safer. And they aren't uh, hard to cut. You just drag the saw around that thin bark tree and, and you have a girdle. So uh, within a couple of years, trees less than three inches were dead uh, completely, all of the sample trees. For larger trees, we tried uh, chainsaw girdle. It's been long used in forestry operations and it kills larger trees. It's a nice job of it. The one caveat here, is these trees often break off at the girdle. So they do present an instant hazard if you're going to follow through with some timber harvesting or other activities within the stand. Be aware of that. Now think about this as an idea. And I want to emphasize the idea because we have little long-term data to demonstrate that it worked. <clears throat> if you cannot wait or will not wait, and you feel compelled to integrate the beach control with timber harvesting, Consider doing it with a feller buncher, where you could accumulate a small beach as a biofuel. Operationally, it would be feasible for larger scale treatments. I've been told if we have 70 tons per acre, or maybe even as few as 50 tons per acre, that was saleable as biofuel, this would work. Just accumulate that stuff and, and put it through the chipper. Cut them low, cut them low as you can, close to the ground, removing all the beach. And here's an example. This is a 15 acre treatment in the north, north uh, western Adirondacks. At, in the insert, you see the stand before the beach treatment and then the result of that. This was a part of the rehabilitation treatment for the areas in the ice storm. And it was reduced to about 45% relative density. There's the 10 year response without beach control. It just got thicker and uglier. And there's the stand with the beach control. There, there's relatively little beach out there. Here's the edge between the two. With no beach control and total beach control. There's no long-term data about this, really. This is an idea. Now, Finch Prime Company, when they own land in the Adirondacks, were doing this treatment. But I haven't uh, looked at the outcome except in the short term. It looked promising then. Our one treatment that I showed you looked promising, where we cut all the beach, large and small. And remember, this is best done during the growing season to control stump sprouting. It's an idea. Give it a try. Give it some thought. I think it potentially could be a real benefit on large areas if because it would be operational, the feasible is done as part of a timber sale if you had a biomass market. Well, to what effect? controlling the beach. Among stands with the beach understory, there's no advanced regeneration or little of it due to uh, the interference and probably due to the heavy shading. So if you do a beach understory control treatment, you have to start a regeneration process from the beginning while simultaneously controlling the beach. And that's a possible risk if you link beach control to overstory cutting where there's a limited or questionable seed source. So you need to have reproductively mature trees within the residual stand and at good spacing. But remember, you have to take all the beach where the plague just returns. 
because new sprouts will come off of the roots of residual beech trees and probably within 10 to 20 feet of a residual beech tree. Root suckers can go up to uh, maybe 25 or 30 feet away based on the work of Renal and Jones and Renal. But there, if you're close to a beech tree, like you see here, you, you're gonna get sprouts. And this is especially true beneath canopy openings or in reduced density stands, as you see here. But look, here's a stand where there was no residual. Uh, it, it's nearby area where you had no residual beach and there are relatively few beach. You can see a few stump sprouts through there. So if you're gonna do the beach control during harvest, take all of it or the plague returns. I think it's better yet to do the site preparation before overstory cutting and doing it in the summer. Beneath the closed canopy stand, the advanced regeneration will develop if there's a seed source, at least the maple will, we've seen it. And if you let it go for about three, maybe up to five years, that advanced regeneration will, will get sizable. And then it'll grow very well upon release. If you look through there, you'll also see it was not just tree seedlings, but there's some herbaceous material as well. It's, that treatment has diversified the vegetative component of the ecosystem considerably. So there's the pattern transforming a area of high beach density to one with diverse understory plants. And after that beach gets of suitable size, then you cut all the remaining beach. And again, it's best done in the summer. And here's the outcome. At the left is an area where the beach was not taken out, it was left in the stand, a selection system cutting, beach dominates. On the right, an area where the beach control was done, sugar maple with yellow birch and white ash. But if you're unwilling to wait or unable to wait, cut all the beach during logging, big, small, and everything in between. And if you have a seed source present and limited browsing, it might just work. It's an idea. I hope you can consider it. Maybe give it a try. But don't play around because if you leave beach to develop, the plague returns. And don't ignore the deer either, where you have a problem. Let's end with a sad lesson, which says that beach followed beach, followed beach, followed beach. If you ignore the beach, it changes the nature of the ecological system. If you do only beach, incomplete beach control, it changes the nature of the ecological system or has that potential. Here's an example. This is on the Huntington Wildlife Forest in Newcomb, New York. They did an improvement cutting in 1952. This is prior to beach bark disease becoming serious. Did a second cutting in 1971. Now the killing front went through at about 65 here. He cut no beach at either time. And we had, we had inventory data from a series of years beginning in 1963 through 2016. In 1960, 61, Bill Tierson uh, tried some stem injection in the area marked within black. He, he took out beach one half to 12 inches and then a few large cults. In 1971, Tiersen and Sage misblew the area marked in blue, and the, the rest of the stand was left untreated. So it gives us a pretty good look at what would happen with these uh, partial complete treatments. So the, the black, the solid black line at the top is the untreated area, and you see it increased and then it declined. Beach. This is beech saplings. In the misblown and stem injection area, there was a slight increase. But in the end, they all ended up with about the same beech density between 400 and 475 saplings per acre. That was probably a balance between upgrowth to the pole class, which reduced the density of beech, and ingrowth from the saplings. Here's the poles. Poles increased in all areas. 
then declined or leveled off. I see no lasting effect from stem injection. And I see uh, really no long-term change from the mist flowing. Through time, ingrowth from saplings refilled beach bowls. And here are these graphic stand tables on the left, the data from 1983. This was after the stem injection and the mist blowing. And then what we found in 2016, really there's no real control through time. You, you see a building up of the sapling class and some poles, a little bit effect within the uh, mist blowing treatments, the bottom right. But look, here are the numbers. This is as of 2016. Seedlings, 3,500 to 4,500, lots of them, all beach, this is beach. Saplings, 400 to 475, all beach. Poles, a little bit of effect here in the mist blowing, 60 per acre as opposed to 90 per acre. Combined, we get between 4,000 and 5,000 trees per acre, all beach, all beach. And now the percentages, two thirds to three quarters of the seedlings are beach, 80 to 90% of the saplings are beach, 90 to 95% of the poles are beach, except with the mist blowing. There's that 60%. That's the re reduction of the saplings, so there was less ingrowth to poles. But combined, we have two thirds to 80% of all species of beach represent, uh, dominating the stand. So the long-term effect of these two partial beach control treatments was nominal. We still have a stand that looks like this with a dense beach understory due to incomplete beach control. So without beach control or with only partial beach control, beach after beach after beach after beach, the beach merry-go-rounds to take it seriously everywhere, take it all, take it all, Get it done. Peter, that's the story. Thank you, Ralph. That was great. Um, and there's been a lot of questions already coming in, but as the host, I get a lead with the first question. So I understand the concept of, of doing a essentially preparatory work to establish advanced regeneration. How, how do you balance that with the potential for deer pressure on those um, seedlings as they're developing? Well, in, in your experience, do deer tend to, and obviously you can get too high of a deer population, but in areas where you've worked or, or maybe where have you seen or not seen deer uh, having an impact on that developing regeneration layer? I think in New York, there's a couple of things that, that where deer density pressure has historically been high. And that's in portions of New York where you have a high percentage of the land covered with forest, the Adirondacks, the, the western part of the southern tier. In the central part of New York where there's a mixture of agricultural and forest, deer browsing has not been as much of a problem. So the plots we had up at Newcomb in the Adirondacks in the in the 50s and 60s, up to, to about 1970, deer was uh, made it impossible to regenerate anything. Up there, they initiated a, a fee hunting program for antlerless deer, for antlerless deer and uh, reduced the density by half. And after that, we've been able to regenerate uh, all the species, even desirable things like uh, white cedar and balsam fir. <clears throat> so, I think you, you have a, hunting is the most effective way, most efficient way anyway, to control deer density. And you need to get that deer density down before you can regenerate uh, species. In many parts of the Adirondacks, the density is not as high anymore. Maybe because the, the beach has become so prominent in the understory, there's very little for the deer to eat close to the ground. In, in the southern tier, we have lots of alternate food sources. So you do need to deal with the deer uh, or you will not, you will not succeed. Okay. So I'll go back to uh, the first question by Gary. 
I was asking how uh, beech leaf disease is likely to affect the abundance of beech over the long term. I have no idea. <clears throat> I have no idea. Uh, I think you need to get in touch with someone like David Houston or some of the uh, forest health specialists and ask that question. Sorry, I can't, I can't comment. <clears throat> Uh, so there's, I won't read, there's some, there's some side conversation about moose browsing. Um, well, so have you, I'll just kind of do a, a transition from some. If I do that, can I see what they're saying? No. Uh, you have to, you have to click, you can, you have to click on the box. Well, I don't know if you can go, if it'll show up again. Let's, let's forget. Uh, try to, Okay, so there's some questions about moose browsing. Do you have experience with moose and would they essentially function? I, I've seen it in New England and Maritimes and it's terrible. They seem to chew them off around four or five feet in the air. Uh, no, but other than that, uh, I cannot answer the question. I, again, there are people who, some of the wildlife folks uh, might answer it in New York, you might contact Stacy McNulty up at Huntington Wildlife Forest. She's a wildlife ecologist and has some experience with uh, moose, but, but uh, I've not had any issues or problems with it. We just don't have moose. Right. So Joan noted that you were you observed an increase in beach after logging, um, and what's going to happen without logging? I guess. The, the beach bark disease is, is the factor that that promotes beach seedling and sapling development in the absence well, of logging. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's uh, there's only circumstantial evidence. I don't know of any real experimental treatments where <clears throat> where people have examined that question. But if you look at well, let's go to the Adirondacks and the Forest Preserve. If you've ever driven through the Adirondacks in the autumn when the leaves are off, you see that dense beach understory everywhere. Uh, and that's not because of logging, because that's protected lands. On the Huntington Wildlife Forest, there's a 1,200-acre reserve area, and beach has become a dominant understory in mid-canopy species there. So while we have only circumstantial evidence, it, it seems to me that the buildup of beach has been fostered by the onset of beach bark disease, uh, it's going to get worse. And, and as it gets worse, as the beach understory forms, you, you get overstory trees dying or being caught, and the gaps get filled with beach, and, and after a period of time, we'll have nothing but beach, just beach after beach after beach, and the beach will get up to a uh, saw timber size or large pole, become infected, die, Produce more suckers. It's going to be an endless merry-go-round of beach. That's a that's my opinion, by the way. Okay. So Stevens uh, was asking a question. We are showing uh, pictures of the low stumping and the high stumping of the beach. Do you put? Do you ever put glyphosate on the stump, or just cut the? Or is it just a mechanical treatment? We, we tried one uh, <clears throat> we tried one treatment where we didn't use glyphosate, but we used uh, Garlon 4. And honestly, we didn't see uh, enough of the improvement. We got complete control with Garlon 4, but the, the numbers of sprouting stumps was so low <laughs> without it that it didn't seem to be worth the investment to do that. But if you're using a brush saw, and you, you cut close to the ground, there's not much place for, uh, there aren't much uh, stem for adventitious buds to be present, and the, the presence of sprouting seems to be nominal. So maybe up to 15% of the sp stumps sprouted, and many of those had these, these uh, little hair-like things at the top of the stump, and they died off. So I, I would just keep using brush soap, keep it as low as you can, and with the, with the leprechaun stick cutting, keep it below that first living branch. Okay. How do you, or do you, or how do you 
um, account for the potential for either resistant and or beach that are either resistant and or tolerant to beach bark disease? That's a really good question. That, that uh, You remember Dave Houston's work long ago indicated that there's maybe one to two percent of the clones that have resistance. And, and note I said clone and not stems. There may be a resistant clone with a bunch of root suckers around them and that whole cluster would be resistant. Tolerance is another question that some trees get the disease but seem to, to die slowly. There's a project going on now at the University of Maine with uh, Laura Kenefick and Bill Livingston and Dave Houston and, and Laura, another Laura, and, and they're looking at uh, trees which have been infected but seem not to die very quickly. So I would I would tune into that, maybe send a message up to Laura Kenefick at the US Forest Service, uh, the Penobscot Experimental Forest, and, and she can give you some clues to the, where they're going with that. But <clears throat> they seem to discern some difference in bark patterns between the trees that ultimately die and those that hang on for long periods of time. So I if I if I were wanting to preserve some beach, I primarily look for resistant clones and save them. And then uh, there's some thought that if, if this work with identifying tolerant trees proves that might also be a uh, potential. Stacey McNulty and I have talked uh, several times uh, about uh, a project which we call gardening the beach. And it deals with this question, if you need to or want to retain some beach within your forest. How do you go about doing that in a realistic way? So it doesn't result in the kind of catastrophe that I've shown. Perhaps Stacy and I could uh, collaborate on a Forest uh, Connect seminar sometime in the future about that. Sure, you are always welcome. Okay, um, Eli is asking about, I think back to the probably the leprechaun sticks and you had mentioned that they remain solid. He wants to know if you can take out those stumps after a couple of years, or or maybe I don't know if that's a mechanical removal, or do you just do you have a sense about how long you have to wait before they they rot sufficiently to get in with the rubber tired skitter? Yeah, it's probably uh, maybe five years. After a while, they they rot off to the point you just push them over. So I think uh, within five years, but not. Certainly, by two years, they're still hard as a rock. And I suppose if you uh, if you cut those things high enough, then the, the skitter can push over them. But uh, the problem is, you got to cut below that lower lower branch. So if it's a sturdy stem, uh, it might just uh, cause a tire puncture. So I'd be very cautious. If you, if you have a well-defined skid trail system, and can stay on those and use the cable or Dollar buncher to reach in, then uh, it should not be a major problem. You have to think it through carefully, but you should be able to work it. If you cut off the lower, this is just came to my mind. If you cut off the lower branch, can you cut? Can you cut higher on the stem? I've not tried it, but I suppose you could. Okay. Someone would give that a try. Uh, Nathan wants to know this. So this is when you're talking about girdling. Um, should you girdle? Do you need to girdle below the lowest living branch? Yes, I, the ones that I did were all done that way. <clears throat> I did the girdling on trees that were a little bit larger than they were probably two inches or three inches in diameter. So uh, there was no problem with finding it below the lowest living branch. But yeah, I would always, I would always cut anything off below lowest living branch because those branches stay alive does girdling result in root sprouting root suckers yeah I, I did not see that i did not i did not see sprouting around the girdle and i was not aware of any stumps any sprouting off the base of the tree i can't tell you if uh if there's off root suckering, but I didn't see stump sprouting. Okay. 
um, if you use glyphosate, Kelly wants to know if you use glyphosate, um, does that restrict the marketability of any beach that have been treated? So if there's if there's glyphosate in the in the in the system, and and a, like a standing beech tree's been killed with glyphosate, does that limit its marketability? I can't answer that question. I just don't know. I think you could get a. Um, you, you might go to the herbicide manual, one of those sources, and and uh, you might be able to get that online and and see whether the what the residual. I know that the, the glyphosate moves up into the tree, uh, but I can't tell you how long it persists in there. Okay. I, I, as a side note, I remember a similar kind of question a few years ago, and somebody wanted to know if if it was reasonable to use beech as firewoods. This was like a you know a, a landowner kind of application, mm -hmm. treated beech. The beech died. Uh, and whether or not there is a, a safety and health concern about using beech firewood with um, that have been treated with, with glyphosate. And my memory is, and I, I think I bounced it off Dave Jackson in, in Pennsylvania, although I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to put words in his mouth. My memory is that it was not a problem from a, uh, from a firewood perspective. So, but I'd, I'd have to look back into that. So Tim is raising a question that basically is getting at when would you recommend using uh, the high stumping versus the low stumping? Is is the real is the primary difference between those two related to the the risk for skitter tires and puncturing? Is there an no. advantage of you know? No, the let me talk about the the uh, brush saw. <clears throat> the first work we did was. Uh, Fairly inexpensive brush saw, and it just wasn't wasn't good. It, it, it had trouble with it because it was overtaxing the machine. So we went and bought a heavy duty brush saw, and we had to spend about a thousand dollars to get the saw, <clears throat> the helmet, gas cans, and you can't buy just one blade. We had to buy a bunch of blades because you inevitably will nick them up. So we ended up with about $1,000 that worked very fine. They're very safe to use because you hook them on a harness and you, the blade is not anywhere near you. You do need to have a second person out there to help with pushing over trees and, and as long as they stay 10 feet from the saw, they're all right. <clears throat> I, I figured that uh, most landowners would not have that $1,000 to lay out and want to spend it. And so the idea of uh, cutting off trees with a shear or a small chainsaw came about as a way to see if we could control beach by cutting using less expensive equipment. And that was the whole logic behind it. Uh, it, didn't, it, it didn't have anything to do with, at the time, thinking about uh, skitters. But if you are concerned about that stub, then you have to cut them off close to the ground, and you can do that either with the feller buncher or you can do it with a brush saw. If you're gonna do it with a chainsaw, you're bending over, it's back breaking. That was the reason of saying, well, cut them off where convenient, because if you don't have to bend over, it's less fatiguing. Your back is uh, feels a lot better at the end of the day. That was the only reason for cutting them high. Well, that's not true. There was a, I'm just remembering that uh, there was a, some work done with Aspen. It may have been Bob Wagner out in, uh, <clears throat> in Canada, uh, in the Lake States area of Canada, where there was some evidence that the taller you cut the stump, the, the lower the potential for sprouting. Uh, I think also uh, Steckler did some of that. But I'm not sure it was absolutely convincing, but there was some evidence, but we did it really for convenience. Okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, says if you kill the understory beach first and then wait three to five years to cut the overstory beach, uh, won't the overstory uh, seed in more beach? 
If if they're producing seedlings, yes. Um, <clears throat> again, go back to Stacy McNulty's work in the Adirondack. She she points out that beech produce quantities of nuts at about a two year cycle. So every second year you find a, a beech nut crop. Um, the other factor is that beech, which are affected by the beech bark disease, the once that uh, disease starts to take effect and you see serious symptoms, beech nut production declines uh, precipitously within those trees. There was work uh, done by uh, Estello and Sage on that. <clears throat> um, apparently, Stacy is finding that uh, as the beech got into pole size and, and, and the mid canopy layers, then the beech nut production within those trees increases. And then any of these uh, tolerant trees will continue to produce some, some beech nuts. So <clears throat> I think that uh, there is the chance of getting those, those uh, beech seedlings going, uh, but that's a risk you have to take, I guess. Note that uh, in our plots up in the Adirondacks, where we, where we took out the beech understory, we began to see from beech seedlings following two heavy masting crops. Where we left the beech in place, we didn't see those seedlings. So it looks to me that the, that beech understory not just uh, interferes with the development of non-beech species, but it can inhibit or prevent seedling regeneration of beech itself. Not sure that answers the question, but that, that's a comment anyway. So Suzanne wants to know how deep the girdle cuts need to be and uh, how do, um, so if, if the tree's already leafed out when you girdle it, what happens to the foliage? Uh, the girdle cuts that I made were just enough to get into the sapwood. And uh, we did it, I did it in the summer. So uh, you just begin to see the foliage dying and uh, the next year they didn't leaf out many of them. Certainly they were all not leafing out by the third year. The ones that hang on for the third year, there was a very limited leaf crop the second year. So they, they, just, they just die in place, fall off. Okay. Uh, Nathan wants to know, uh, he's interested in beech for its mast production um, and trying to save some, but worried about, you know, you, you, were, you were relatively unambiguous uh, about the, the extent of control. And so is there a way to like do, to retain some beech, um, but not set yourself up for failure if your goal is to have some beech mast production? Yeah, that's that's the question that Stacy McNulty and I have been talking about the, <clears throat> the idea of gardening the beach. Stacy has some very profound evidence showing the importance of beach to many wildlife animals. Uh, bear is one of them. Um, some, of the, some of the small mammals, if if they don't have beach nuts, then they're not so abundant, and the predatory species on them. Uh, the populations will decline temporarily. <clears throat> so we've we've talked about how you could move ahead uh, and save some beach. The only thing we really came up to up to this point was the idea of if you find a resistant clone, save it. Uh, now that there's some evidence coming out of uh, Maine that some trees may be tolerant, that you may be able to identify trees that'll be tolerant, then you might find some of those and, and leave those. I would remember the root suckers will come up from those trees within a 20 to 25 feet most of the, of the parent main stem. And so you might leave whatever uh, resistant tree you find in any uh, surrounding root suckers, immediately surrounding root suckers. And that would preserve the beach. If, if we get to a point where we can identify a truly tolerant beets that will hang on for long periods of time and continue to produce mast, then you could do the same thing with those. The other possibility, if you want to invest some money, 
if you, I've, I've seen that some of these tolerant trees have seedlings beneath them. And if you can find seedlings beneath a tolerant tree, you might dig them up and move them around with the idea that there may be tolerance in those, in those trees. But remember, if a, if a tree is dying from beech bark disease, all of the suckers around it are the same clone. And all of those trees would probably die the same way once they got to a point where they're infected. So my mentor said, Ralph, you need to learn ruthlessness. And here's a case where you have to be ruthless, except if you carefully pick out the trees or clusters of clone, of clone that you want to keep and then maintain those, but watch the development. If you clear the beach from the rest of the stand, you, you should be okay. You're, you're, you're dedicating a portion of the stand to, to wildlife food, and that's okay. If that's your objective, don't, don't feel bad about it. Okay. Uh, so Norm raises a point about the option to let uh, the beach situation run its course because beach tends to grow on the poor quality soils. Is that is that something you've seen? Is that going to well, how is that going to play out through time? A couple things, you know, we when you're when you're talking about forestry aimed at producing commodities, it's always been a truism that uh, poor quality sites are not worth investments. You don't get them back. So, uh, if but on the better quality sites, we we tried. Back in the 80s, there was, <clears throat> there was a thought at that time that you might be able to, if you looked up at a beach and the, the crowd wasn't too bad, particularly the pole sized beach, it looked fairly dense. Uh, let's leave those, create some space around them as you were to thinning and grow them till they got to be larger. And then they, you take them out as a commodity. And, and what I found is that uh, those trees became infected and produced a lot of root suckers. And, and uh, even in stands where we did some limited beach control, we just got it back again because the, because the root suckers off the trees we left in the stand. So I I think the that got me uh, against the idea of, of trying to be friendly with beach <laughs> and to be a bit more ruthless and, and decide if, unless you had a reason to retain some beach, get rid of it and start from the beginning. It never will be absolutely absolutely missing. It'll always be there. We've never been able to absolutely clean out all the beach, and that's okay. It'll be there in limited numbers, and you can live with that. Yes. So I would I would uh, not try to um, develop and let it come along. You, in, you're you're delaying time when you can begin to diversify the plant community on the ground by virtue of that tactic. Okay, next question from Dale is whether there's any evidence of um, allelopathic effects from beech to other species. What effects? Allelopathy. Oh, <clears throat> I don't know of any. I, I don't, not sure of it. I, I'm, I guess you'd have to try to contact Dave Houston and ask him that one. Um, there's a question that wants to know if you, what's your familiarity and opinion of, uh, and I'm not familiar with, I'm drawing a blank, there's an acronym CFRU, research on low dose glyphosate that preserve maple regeneration. Yeah, that was the work that Bob Wagner and <clears throat> one of his students did up in, up in Maine where <clears throat> they had to, uh, Beech and maple, and, and I see maybe some raspberries, and they they sprayed on a low dose. And the evidence that they present suggests that uh, you, you do kill some of the maple, but uh, but some of it will will persist. I have not seen those plots. I have. That's only one trial that I know about. I think you you could go to <clears throat> the published source. The material they published and read it and um, and make a judgment. It might be worth a try, but 
something like that, which I would try on a small scale rather than a large scale and see whether it worked. I had a question whether the presence of raspberries in those stands might have helped protect some of the maple. But since I have not seen the plots or the areas or, or talked to Bob about it, uh, I really can't comment more than suggest you read the, the publication. Tim wants to know if you cut a beech tree in April, could you go back in July and resurface the stump and apply herbicide? I'll let Peter answer that question. We've not tried that. Historically, people have said you have to do it very soon. But Pete, you tried some delayed treatments, haven't you? We did, and we actually, so I don't know if we did it a three month delay, but we looked at it essentially the first, so winter cutting and then resurfacing in the first growing season and second growing season. And we had better, so it killed, in every case, it killed the tree that was resurfaced, the stump. And we had 50 to 70% control of root suckers with greater control during the second growing season than if it was resurfaced during the second growing season. So, um, okay, so there's just people can follow along. Uh, some comments. Uh, so Marie wants to know, after girdling, how long does it take young seedlings to die? See, saplings or seedling saplings or poles? The, the trees that I treated were <clears throat> not much more than three and a half inches and well, probably uh, an inch and a half to two inches and and most of those died in the, after one year. They didn't leaf out in the second growing season. The ones that are around three and a half inches, maybe four inches, somewhere in three to three and a half inches, uh, some of them leafed out in for the second year and then died. So certainly within two and three years, they would, they would be dead. But most of them, the smaller ones, were dead the first year. Okay. The question uh, Nathan wants to know when you talk about removing all of the beach, are you referring to the area that you're treating? Um, and to what extent do you need to work in areas that are adjacent to the treatment area? Well, I was primarily thinking about the treatment area uh, in, in the sense that we, we usually manage one stand at a time. And, and then fit the others in by some sort of a long-term plan that sequences what stand gets treated next. Um, I, I, would, I would hope that we could get to a point where through our planning, we know what's to, what stands will be ready for a timber sale or, or silviculture regeneration measures cutting three or four or five years from now and begin the site preparation by the beach control before we do the overstory disturbance. And it's going to be a lot less expensive to do it either chemically or mechanically that way. And then it will also give a chance to, for advanced regeneration to develop. So when we do the overstory cutting, we get a good response. The, the advanced regeneration is particularly important with the shade tolerant species. <clears throat> if you start off maple and birch and ash, and cherry at the same time, maple will grow the slowest, at least in the earlier years. And there's a, there's a, a chance that it gets overtopped by these less shade tolerant species, and you lose it from the stand. We have an example in the Adirondacks where the stand started out with, with sugar maple and yellow birch being in equal numbers. And, and by the time the stand was 40 years old, there was very little maple left. In the early years, the birch grows more rapidly in height than the maple. It overtopped the maple, and even the shade tall maple died. So there's, a, there's abundant evidence that if you want to have maple be part of the main canopy, at least following an even age regeneration method, then you ought to 
get that maple started as advanced regeneration. Okay. Uh, so Laura Kenefick is a participant and she makes reference to the, the beach tolerance project and offers her email address if somebody's interested for more information on that. Yeah, get that. Uh, it's, it's interesting to watch that uh, PowerPoint presentation. And Laura has been a presenter on the webinar series and and uh, uh, will certainly be welcome. She or her colleagues will certainly be welcome in the future with, with that or other topics. Uh, okay, so I'm just reading there's uh, Do you have any information on what it costs? to do the different kinds of uh, mostly mechanical treatments. So, you know, brush saw, feller buncher, chainsaw cutting prior to logging, any cost information on that? There, I don't, we didn't do cost studies. I, it take about a minute to a minute and a half on average, all practices to do the brush saw work. And if you look into the literature about uh, release cuttings or spacing, cuttings in northern New England or over in the Maritimes, there's a, there's a lot of information about, uh, about that treatment. I think that's where I got the minute to a minute and a half. The, the shearing, the leprechaun sticks, that's, uh, that goes very quickly with the small trees. As you get, you get up in size, it takes longer. Uh, but I, did, I don't have any cost studies. I didn't time them. And we didn't time the, uh, the treatment with the chainsaw. So I don't have any cost figures. We've done some uh, work with loggers that have feller bunchers and had uh, worked out a deal with them based on their estimates of time and our estimates of time where they were essentially low stumping all of the beach. And this would be if we had stem sapling stem counts of oh, roughly 300 to 700 stems per acre. Uh, we were paying them about $100 an acre for the feller bunch of work. If it was, and then we had, the price was reduced if it was below 200 uh, beach stems per acre. I will comment that uh, Bob McGregor, the director of forest properties for the College of Environmental Science and Forestry, has an operation ongoing at Huntington Wildlife Forest in Newcomb where they're applying one of these feller buncher treatments to remove the beach as a part of a, of a partial cutting in, in the area that I illustrated. He, he's getting uh, cost information. Uh, they've, been, they've been able to attract a contractor to do it commercially. So you might just, uh, watch stuff that might come out of uh, the forest properties at uh, Newcomb to, to see what what findings they they have there that's going to be a good idea too okay um so john cleveland is one of your former students and he's Pleased to hear about work. Uh, lots of people saying thank you. Um, is Eli wants to know if mowing is effective against the uh, against uh, raspberry when you get overabundance of raspberries or blackberries? No, <laughs> no. You mow them down, they'll come back. Uh, look, we we have not had any real problem with raspberries. My, my primary findings with raspberries were in stands where we were doing a shelter with seed cutting. And these were in uh, mature types of stands. These were trees which had large, or stands which had large trees over 100 years of age. And uh, we found that uh, in the shelter wood cuttings, the we got an immediate regeneration of uh, maple and birch and, and, and ash 
and pin cherry and paper birch, uh, a variety of species. By the, by the third year, the raspberry were, had a complete cover across the ground, but you began to see the things like the, the ash and the cherry popping up raspberries. And by seven or eight years, the, those less shade tolerant trees were beginning to shade the raspberries and the ras raspberries were weakening. And, and as that happened, then the maple got a spurt of growth. And by the 10th year, we had a complete canopy of trees and the raspberries were essentially gone. <coughs> and I've seen this in several sites. So at least here in New York, we have not viewed raspberries as a, as a major problem. I, in the upper lake states, I think there's a different issue where they may not have the, they may have primarily sugar maple and don't get these other rapidly growing trees that will overtop the red raspberries and, and cause them to decline. It may be true in some of the conifer types as well. <coughs> but at least here in, in, in our area, we've not had a problem with raspberries. Either the red raspberries or the blackberries. Okay. So there are a lot of, there are lots of people saying thank you. Very, they're very much appreciative um somebody said thanks now i have more work to do <laughs> <laughs> which, which i think ralph that's a, that's a sign of success right when, when you've uh, changed behavior so well just remember what my mentor said ralph you've got to be ruthless when it comes to beach i've told people the only good beach is a dead beach i get criticized for that but just remember what your job is what you're trying to accomplish. <coughs> so I think that's all of the, so here's Mike is offering approximate prices from Canada, uh, Canadian dollars per hectare. Basil bark herbicide is 400 to 600. And then brush saw treatment, seven, 750 to $1,000. That's Canadian dollars. Per hectare. So cut them about in so half. Of the yeah, thanks. I'll, uh, I'll re repost that for people to see. Okay, well, Ralph, I want to thank you. This was uh, a fabulous presentation and obviously a wealth of knowledge. You, I love having you all. You have great content, but you also generate great numbers of participants for me. So I appreciate that very much. My greetings, uh, everybody. You know Remember, be ruthless. <laughs> and Ralph will be back at seven o'clock tonight if you want to see this again. And, and this was uh, recorded and will be archived on the YouTube channel. Thank you all very much. Have a great afternoon. Ralph, I'll see you back this evening. I'll be here. Great. Thank you.